Good evening everybody. Welcome to our um, webinar. I have a, a few words um, regarding our guest tonight, Rod Hine. He was born just after the war he, and he was about 10 when his aunt Florrie gave him a book for Christmas. It was The Boy's Book of Space by Patrick Moore. He was already interested in anything to do with science and engineering and he devoured the book from cover to cover. Shortly afterwards, Sputnik 1 was launched and seeing it pass over London clinched his interest in physics and space travel. Pretty soon he was deeply involved in electronics and amateur radio. He passed the RAE in 1962 and later took up the call sign Golf 8 Alpha Quebec Hotel. Um, he took physics, chemistry and maths at A-level and in 1964 went to Churchill College, Cambridge to study natural sciences. He later switched to electrical sciences and after graduating joined Marconi at Chelmsford, working for several years on satellite communications. That job eventually took him to Nairobi, Kenya, after which he worked there in the meteorological communications and later switched to teaching at the Kenya Polytechnic. In 1972, he married a Yorkshire lass that he'd met in Nairobi, Nairobi, and he finally moved back to the UK in 1976. Since then, he's had a variety of jobs in electronics and industrial controls. He was co-founder of Bradford Instruments Limited, which designed and supplied industrial control systems from 1982 and only finished training, trading sorry, in 2012. From about 2000, he's been lecturing part-time at the University of Bradford, although he now seems to have been retired, as the electrical engineering department has been wound right down. He got back into astronomy around 1992, when his wife Josie bought him an astronomy book, and he joined the Bradford Astronomical Society. He's currently chairman of these of the Bradford Astronomical Society, mostly because no one else is prepared to do the job. Unfortunately, <laughs> a phrase we hear in a lot of societies, and I'm sure you'll all agree. Anyway, please put your hands together, our good wave, to welcoming Rod Hind. Thank you very much. Over to you, Rod. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Is that about right volume? Yep. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Right, uh, just to correct one thing, I, I am actually no longer the chairman of Bradford Astronomy Society. Ah. I have finally passed it over to Sue Stubbs, who's doing a wonderful job. Um, so that, that's one, one little burden off my shoulders. So, um, my favourite dish is, well, it's, it's not an ex exercise in culinary uh, prediction, pre predilections, uh, although I am very fond of my food. Having said that, since the lockdown started, I've managed to lose a bit of weight, so perhaps this is not a bad thing after all. Um, <clears throat> you'll see from the, the title I've put down, Rod Hine, D-A-R-A Antenna Consultant, School of Physics and Astronomy, University of Leeds. So at the age of 74, I've actually come out of retirement yet again, and I'm employed just, just on a part-time basis. So the whole story of this uh, presentation is how this came about and how it's managed to combine several of my absolute favourite interests, namely electronics, astronomy and satellite communications, particularly these wonderful dishes that were built many years ago. So let's just crack on with a quick, whoops, hang on, I've got the wrong screen up, hang on just a minute, I've got to, got to do that and that and now I should be able to move on yep okay so what I'm going to do in a quick synopsis is first of all consider what is radio astronomy the history of it uh, leading up to the concept of very long baseline interferometry then we're going to look at what are satellite earth stations and the history of that and then finally how this project the DARA project is bringing them together for the future particularly in developing countries and then we'll just review a little bit of the success of the story so far in see, actually seeing a picture of a black hole. So that's what we're in for now. So history of radio astronomy. Um, we'll, we'll go right from the first attempts at, at uh, radio astronomy by a couple of guys called Scheiner and Vilsing in Germany in 1896 
and even our own Oliver Lodge in 1897 to 1900. We'll then see why there was a big gap and why nobody took an interest in radio astronomy until about 1931 when Carl Jansky first opened up the, the subject as, as such. Then we'll look at a few other key achievements and people who were involved in this and how the, uh, how the, the story of radio astronomy developed. So let's crack on. Right, very earliest attempts to observe radio waves from outer space, in other words, radio astronomy, were actually done in about 1896 by a couple of pairs of German researchers called Julius Scheiner and Johannes Wilsing. There's a picture there of Julius Scheiner, and there's no picture of Johannes Wilsing, but we have a picture of his crater on the moon, because he has a crater named after him on the moon. Now, what these guys did, they used very early radio equipment, which was only just in the process of being developed with things called coherers, and they tried to measure uh, radiation from outer space. They failed miserably because their, their equipment was insensitive by several, fat, several orders of magnitude, so they didn't really stand a chance, but it was an interesting, uh, an interesting little sideline, and they, they did their, their best to make it work. Uh, you may have come across, if you're a photographer, you may have come across the name Shiner because Julius Shiner went on to do a lot of work in photography and it was, it was he that developed a, a system for classifying film speeds. So if you go back 50 years when we used to buy film canisters, they would have the DIN rating and the ASA rating and the Shiner rating and that's named after him. Um, Oliver Lodge, uh, working from Liverpool University, was an early pioneer, pioneer in radio. And Oliver Lodge actually was instrumental in developing detection systems and tuning systems for radio waves, um, arguably before Marconi was on the scene. And it was actually Oliver Lodge that, had, that uh, got one or two of the early patents on that. And he tried to measure uh, radiation from outer space and particularly from the sun, and he too failed. But in his case, it was a bit marginal because he was trying to do it from the middle of Liverpool. And even in the 18, nine, late 1890s, uh, Liverpool had a very advanced electrical system uh, supplying electricity to transport systems, trolley buses, trams, factories. And the level of ambient, ambient background noise would have exceeded the, uh, the signal from the sun anyway. So that was a, a, a bit of a, a damp squib. So those were both no-shows at radio astronomy. Then a rather curious thing happened because along came Marconi and in 1901 managed to develop his system. He started working on it about sort of 1895 or so, developing the system and getting transmission further and further. And by 1901 he had transmitted a signal across the Atlantic from the, the picture there. That's Pole U Cove in Cornwall, uh, the Headland Hotel. And um, that was his transmitter station, and he managed to transmit a radio signal across to Newfoundland. Now, at the time, people said it couldn't be done because they knew that radio waves, based on Maxwell's theories, would travel in straight lines. Marconi was convinced that they would work somehow. And of course, it turned out that the explanation for why Marconi's radio waves worked and traveled around the, earth, around the surface of the Earth was that in the atmosphere, uh, uh, particularly high up in an area called the ionosphere, were, were some layers of ion, ionized air. Sunlight and radiation causes the air to be ionized and the conducting uh, nature of the atmosphere, even though very thin and tenuous, means that radio waves get reflected and refracted around the curvature of the earth. That wasn't properly explained until 1902 and Oliver Heaviside put together uh, a, a coherent theory of this and so the, uh, the layers in the atmosphere, usually known as the, uh, the Kennelly Heaviside layers after Heaviside and his co-worker. This turned out to be a bit of a setback for radio astronomy because people not unnaturally assumed that, well, we can observe that all the radio waves at the low frequencies that they were using, they all seem to get bounced off the underside of this layer. And that surely means that radio waves from outside the Earth are going to be, get bounced off the outside, so they're not going to get through. So actually, there is a bit of an argument that people did really discounted any idea of receiving radio waves for quite some time. But of course, it turned out this is frequency dependent. And as the, as the century wore on in 1902, 
led on to 19. 10, by which time there was a well-established maritime communication system using radio, the frequencies were getting higher and higher, the wavelengths shorter and shorter, and eventually um, something was going to give. And of course what happened eventually, uh, after a lot of development work was done, people realised there was a lot of extra noise in radio signals than they'd expected. And a chap called Carl Jansky over in the States was working for the Bell Corporation, and he had been tasked with finding out where this excess noise was coming from. And he built this rather amazing antenna, which is about 100 feet from side to side and about 20 feet high. And it runs around on a track with, made, uh, with, with wheels from four, four wheels from old Ford, motor, Ford Model T motor cars. He built this amazing contraption and used it as a kind of a steerable area, aerial, working on a frequency of about 20 megahertz or wavelength of 15 meters. And not only did he um, identify some of the actual uh, earthbound terrestrial sources of noise, he also found a source of noise that came from apparently everywhere in the sky. Well, not quite everywhere because it varied a bit with a period of 23 hours and 56 minutes. Now, of course, all of you as astronomers will realize the significance of this. He had actually discovered radio waves from outer space because the radio waves were actually tied to the uh, the background stars and that's why the the signals varied with a period of 23 hours and 56 minutes and not 24 hours as if it was anything to do with the sun. So that led to uh, the, the very first sort of tentative uh, uh, beginnings of radio astronomy. But again nobody took too much interest in this uh, that was his frequencies in wavelength he used. Nobody really took a great deal of interest in it until a few years later, when a chap called Grote Reba in 1937 decided to build in his backyard this amazing telescope. Yes, there we are, a fully steerable parabolic reflector about 20 feet across. Quite an amazing achievement just done in his spare time. He was a radio operator, radio worker in his spare time. Not only did he uh, design and build the actual mechanics of the dish. He was also working on a detector which worked at the incredibly high frequency then of 3.3 gigahertz, 3,300 megahertz, wavelength of about 10 centimeters. That was pretty unheard of at that time. He actually drew a blank with the measurements at that frequency, so he then scaled it down to 900 megahertz, a uh, wavelength of about just over 30 centimeters. And then again, he tried again at 160 megahertz with a wavelength of just less than two meters. And there he did actually observe signals from the, from the Milky Way. This took him about a year to do this. So, but in 1938, he measured signals from the Milky Way. And over the next few years, he basically single-handed as the sole radio astronomer in the whole world. He made a plot of the sky in, at radio frequencies. Um, of course, what was looming on the horizon was World War II, which had got well underway by the time Grote where Reba was making, making progress. And what happened, of course, at this time was that all the bright people in universities and research establishments, they were all diverted to war work. And um, of course, we, we all know that uh, the development of telecommunications and radio and radar in the world in World War II was quite crucial to the progress of the war. By the end of the war, uh, there were lots of people coming out of the forces, all trained in radio work and radio and radar. Uh, and also there was a lot, lot of surplus equipment made for the purpose, radio sets and radar sets, all available on the surplus radio, surplus uh, um, forces. Uh, market at uh, knockdown prices. So when the dust had settled after um, Mr. Hitler's uh, world tour, the next thing that happened, of course, there was a lot of these people went back to universities to resume their studies, to do, complete their PhDs and resume their professorships and lectureships. And a lot of them took their experience with them. One of the first people to really catch on with this was Bernard Lovell. Now, Bernard Lovell uh, had done a lot of useful work on radar in, in World War II, and he worked at uh, Manchester University. And he wanted a place that was radio quiet because he, he realized that trying to do measurements from the middle of Manchester 
with all the electrical uh, in electrical disturbances and interference that was not going to go down too well so he approached the university authorities and they said well why don't you try the uh, try using a corner of the the uh, Manchester University agricultural field station out at a place called Jodrell Bank a few miles away uh, toward in in, uh, in Cheshire so that is the story of the beginning of Jodrell Bank of course and at first it was just a wooden hut which you can see there with a trailer an old World War II radar trailer uh, and a bit of old equipment uh, but it wasn't long before Bernard Lovell and his uh, workers <coughs> were putting together more and more elaborate radio telescopes some of them just arrays of wires on the ground uh, the first one was a basically a, a big large dish made of wire spread out across the ground with a big pole in the middle that could be moved around as a kind of a steering device but eventually by the mid 1950s Bernard Lovell wanted to build a proper parabolic reflector and do the job properly and of course that led to the genesis of Jodrell Bank you can see a picture there of the original design of Jodrell Bank it's under construction there and if you look carefully you'll see that this structure is pretty spidery and that it has a very deep reflector and in fact the um, the when it was finished the early feed horn as it were the feed uh, horn was more or less on a, on a level with the edge of the reflector um, just let me just click on something's come up I'll click on admit that's it um, <clears throat> so this was the characteristic of the early design of radio telescope they thought that they needed a very deep uh, short focal length parabolic dish it turned out not to be the best idea so if we look at a later development of Jodrell Bank oops, well, let's go down you'll see that the in later days it was completely refurbished a new reflector was built inside the older one with a much shallower dish much longer focal length and this time the the pickup tower actually projects well beyond the edge of the dish now the original dish is still there underneath and of course that adding the extra dish on top made the, meant the whole thing weighed a lot more than it had before so that's why they had to reinforce the support rings with the with the double uh, sort of double bicycle wheel arrangement compared to the single i'll just flip back so you can see the difference quite noticeable now just as a bit of a side the main engineering designer of the um, of the uh, Jodrell Bank was a chap called Charles Husband Husbands and Company of Sheffield who did the design and it was built by Dorman Long now <clears throat> we'll see that that wasn't the only thing that uh, that had changed with uh, with uh, the design of telescopes Bernard Lovell was working at Manchester as I've said um, Meanwhile, over at Cambridge, Martin Ryle came back and set up a department for radio astronomy. And he worked in a rather different way because he was beginning to see the, the, the advantages, not of what, having one large steerable dish, but having an array of steerable dishes which could be spread out over a long baseline. Now, it turned out to be very convenient because immediately uh, to, the, to the west of Cambridge, running due east and west, there was a disused railway line about five miles long through a place called Lord's Bridge. So Martin Ryle and his, his people set up a research station there, which then became the, uh, the uh, let me just click on that to admit, yeah, um, which then became the, the Mullard radio, Observ radio, radio Astronomy Observatory. Um, so he, he was working on rather different lines as you can see but nevertheless a lot of work was done in the 50s and 60s and in the 1960s a whole a whole line of dishes were built along the railway line uh, some of them were fixed and others could be moved along the railway along a railway track to change the positions and in fact Marconi's were building some of those dishes while I was working from them uh, for them in the in the early days what are some other things that happened well in 1965 uh, these two chaps Penzias and Wilson were charged by Bell Telephone Labs to recondition one of the early hoghorn antennas at a place called Holmdel New, Jer New Jersey these had been used in early radio satellite communication experiments and their brief was to refurbish it and use it for 
radio astronomy. And of course, I'm sure you know the story. They took over the work on this and they checked everything out. They cleaned it and scrubbed it and reconditioned all the equipment. But when they started making measurements, they found they had a lot more noise than they'd expected. And they investigated all the possible sources of noise. Could it be radiation from the recent H-bomb test in the atmosphere? No. Could it be noise from New Jersey and New York, which are not far away? No, it wasn't that. And eventually they too realized that there was radiation coming from outer space. Only this time it was coming uniformly from all over the sky and it didn't vary hardly a jot during the daytime or nighttime. And of course it turned out that they had accidentally discovered the cosmic microwave background radiation, which ironically several other uh, astronomers and astrophysicists had been looking for for some years. It had been predicted by um, by George Gamow and a couple of others uh, some years before and they found the the remnants of, a, of the um, Big Bang which turned out to be the cosmic microwave background radiation. That's another story of course. Another little story that's rather nice I think is the story of Hewish and Bell in 1967 and I have a particular interest in this because I was an undergraduate from 1964 to 1967 and initially Tony Hewish was, was my director of studies and of course as a mere undergraduate you don't get anywhere near the research uh, that's the postgrads who do that as, as Jocelyn Bell was a postgrad student at the time but nevertheless Tony would tell us on his uh, during his sort of off-duty off moments he would tell us all about this interesting work they were doing and the strange strange results they were getting from their telescope array. Tony Hewish's idea was to measure the scintillation of background radiation, scintillation of radio sources, because he realized that if you could uh, measure the degree of scintillation of, of source, you could learn two things. First of all, you could learn about the behavior of the, the variation of the, um, in the interstellar medium, which was what caused the scintillation as the changes in electron density swept across the field of view but also a point source would scintillate in a rather different way from a, a from a distributed source so by using his system he hoped to be able to in immediately tell the difference between uh, the so-called quasars such as 3c273 which had just been discovered uh, which are point sources they should scintillate a lot more than diffuse radio sources but of course, it just turned out that the particular design of his radio telescope, which consisted of literally miles and miles of wire spread over 4,000 poles stuck in the, across the field, um, it turned out that the exact characteristics of his telescope were just exactly right for Jocelyn Bell to accidentally discover these, these uh, little bits of scruff, as she's called it. These were little traces which appeared on the recordings at particular times of the day and which turned out to be pulsars. So that's a brief potted history of some of the early discoveries in, in the history of radio astronomy. Um, let's go into more detail on radio astronomy and look at some of the terminology, and the technology that's used. First of all, before you can do anything, you need to be able to measure things. And that's where we bring in a unit called the Jansky. Then we'll look at a few features about gain and noise temperature and beam width of the antennas to see how you're going to design the best antennas and then we'll look at some of the different designs of antenna and how they're used to build up pictures uh, of the sky. So that's for the next few slides. So what on earth is the Jansky, obviously named after Carl Jansky? Well <coughs> radio sources are incredibly weak, that's why you need pretty large dishes to pick the signals up, um, so they're measured in units called Janskys. Now Jansky is a very small amount of power basically. It is actually 10 to the minus 26 watts per square meter per hertz. Let's look at that. So 10 to the minus 26 watts, that's a measure of energy. That's per square meter, so that's an incredibly small amount of energy to be able to detect. What's the per hertz, hertz to the minus one? Well in uh, to, in the system that we, we that uh, radio, radio engineers know, then everything has to be measured within a certain bandwidth. 
because the noise power or power is generally spread across a particular frequency range. So what you're interested in is the power per, per bandwidth. So that means that if you want to increase the sensitivity, you can increase the bandwidth, which increases the power you can pick up, but it reduces the discrimination you get. So there's a trade-off there. Once you've realized how you can measure sources by their effects as you measure them from, the, from uh, readings from radio telescopes, you can then start plotting them against wavelength. And that's where we have this nice little chart over on the right hand side of the picture. And you can see the left hand scale is flux density in Janskis. So starting for one Jansky at the bottom and going up to 10 to the eighth Janskis at the top. <coughs> then across the top, uh, we have wavelength, 10 meters, one meter, 10 centimeters, and one centimeters, and the corresponding frequency across the bottom, that's uh, 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 megahertz. And you can see there's some rather strange lines across that going in all different directions, suitably labeled. Let's just look at one or two bits of that so we can identify a few things. Now, the first thing you see is that there is a sky background uh, which just slopes down nicely uh, and that's a, that's the sort of a fairly fairly standard thing that can easily be measured. Uh, above that in a higher region we have uh, the signals which are received from the sun and the particularly when the sun is active it produces a peak of activity about one meter one meter wavelength. When it's quiet it's a lot different as you can see down there. One of the other bright sources in the, in the radio sky is of course Jupiter because if you look at Jupiter there on the left hand side you'll see that Jupiter produces quite a lot of radio waves in the sort of 10, 20, 30 megahertz region. Coming down a bit further we can see lines now associated with objects such as Cassiopeia, Cygnus, Crab Nebulae. These are all the signature of radiation from supernova remnants. So we can see they have a particular characteristic and then a little bit further down we have characteristics from M31, the galaxies, and then going further down we have slightly different characteristics, the signature of the signals from quasars like 3C273 and then there are a few other odd things and then if you look down Jupiter has a little bit of a peak again at about 10 gigahertz, 10,000 megahertz and even Mars has some radiation at that level but of course very faint. So that gives you quite a good idea because you can see lots of the really interesting characteristics of things in the sky and understanding how those signals vary with frequency and with activity leads us to understand the physics and the astronomy of the things that generate it. So there we have it, uh, radio sources characterized by measurements in Janskis. Um, just one or two things about the performance of signals. What we're interested in in most cases is not the absolute value of the signal but the re relationship of the signal relative to the noise because there's no point amplifying a signal if you're amplifying a load of noise with it. What you want to do is maximize the signal to noise ratio and again this has to be measured in the same bandwidth to be meaningful. <coughs> now it also turns out that um, almost every object in the in the universe uh, has a temperature and at, uh, the effect of atoms moving at a particular temperature means that they give off radiation characteristic of that temperature uh, just as per black body arrangements. So if you look at the uh, little calculation there you can see that Boltzmann's constant comes into this and that the noise relative to the signal to noise ratio is also related to Boltzmann's constant and the temperature and that's why we sometimes call call the noise we call it a noise temperature rather than a noise level. Uh, as far as the size of the dish is concerned little calculation here we can see that the gain of a dish is given by that expression across there uh, pi d squared pi d over lambda all squared times ea which is an efficiency of aperture covering. Um, that tells you that in order to get uh, higher gain, in other words higher amplification, the diameter of your dish has to be large relative to the wavelength. Uh, 
and also the thing it, it works the other way, way as well uh, the greater the gain the narrower the beam so HPBW is the half power beam width and that's also also related to the gain so in the bottom there you can see that the gain is inversely related to the beam width so there's a few little formulae there which give you some guidance on how to design the dish and calculate the actual amplification and gain of the dish. Take a little example, if you have a 25 meter dish working at a frequency of 1.4 gigahertz, and that's the hydrogen line, H1 line, 21 centimeter radiation, that has a gain of 140,000 times or 52 decibels relative to isotropic and it has a half power beam width of 0.48 of a degree or 0.0084 radians. So that's quite a narrow beam from a 25 meter dish. But it'll give you a lot of signal because you've got a huge gain factor there of uh, 140,000 times relative to isotropic. So that gives you some idea of why in order to get the sensitivity for radio astronomy, you need a large dish and you need a lot of amplification. The early receiver systems had extreme problems of noise and the way to overcome this was to either operate in a, a very narrow bandwidth which limited the amount of data or you had to cool the front end of the receiver with liquid helium at 4, 4 Kelvin to reduce the noise. Remember I said that there's this thing of noise temperature. If you just take an ordinary resistor, a common or garden uh, electronic component called the resistor, then uh, at a particular temperature, it will generate a certain amount of noise. If you cool it down to liquid helium temperature, four Kelvin, then you reduce the amount of noise dramatically compared to ambient temperature of about 300 Kelvin. Now, there have been improvements now and modern low noise receivers are available for much better use even at ambient temperatures. But even so, for ultimate performance, uh, there is a tendency for the uh, radio astronomy receivers to have to be cryogenically cooled. Uh, they tend not to use liquid helium anymore, they use, but they use a, hyd a helium refrigerator system that gets down to about 15 Kelvin. So that's why you, you hear about cryogenically cooled receiver systems. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so receiver sensitivity is very important, goes along with the gain of the dish. Now, of course, the design of these dishes means that they are effectively a one pixel device. Yeah, you don't have a, an eyepiece to look through, you just have a terminal that you connect up to a, a chart recorder or these days a computer. So you're effectively making a spot measurement of the signal level in the beam. And that means to actually make a map of anything or a picture of an, an image in the sky, you have to scan backwards and forwards to form an image. The early, early ways of doing this tended to rely on the, when before the fully steerable devices came along, what they had to do was just aim the dish in a particular direction or aim the beam in a particular direction and wait for the rotation of the earth to sweep the beam across the sky and then build up the picture slowly, slowly that way, line by line, day by day. But of course later on, typically with Jodrell Bank being fully steerable, it was then possible to steer backwards and forwards by a raster method. They would tend to do it first of all left and right, left and right going down and then up and down going towards the left and right. So basically sort of making two scans in opposite and perpendicular directions and weaving together the signal to form a, form a, a two-dimensional map of the sky. <clears throat> Obviously fairly easy to understand but of course rather tedious to build up a picture of what was seen in the sky. Excuse me while I have a quick sup of water. Thanks. Okay, so that's single dish, dish observing with one pixel. Now you can do form tricks with, with fixed uh, devices by using what are called beam forming techniques. Uh, that picture there shows a picture of a, a radio telescope array that I visited in Mexico last summer and it consists of several thousand dipoles spread across the field rather like uh, uh, rather like um, Tony Hewish's array but with rather more modern technology and what they do there they take a number of 
connections from that, uh, 64 different cables to be precise. And then by combining the signals from those different sections of the array, they can actually form a number of multiple beams. Um, and that means, of course, that rather than just scanning across the sky in one, in one line during the daytime as the Earth rotates, they can scan across and form eight beams at the same time. And of course, that produces, that produces great improvements in the uh, performance of the, of the telescope. You can cover a lot, a lot more sky and do a lot more useful work. Um, it's now just becoming possible to use the same sort of techniques for uh, radio telescopes that we know. And that's why this is a very recent development called the uh, ASCAP telescope. It's the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder project. And what they've done, they've taken parabolic dishes, in this case they're going to be 12 metre dishes, with a fairly short focal length, f.5, so that's a 6 metre focal length and diameter of 12 metres. Uh, and the, the, rather than having a point feed at the focus, in the focal plane, there's this array of detectors. Um, they have 96 pairs of feed elements uh, arranged for clockwise and counterclockwise polarization. And that 96 uh, array pairs, which you can see the little spots on the, on the surface of the disk there, those are all fed independently into a computer and digitally processed. And that gives you effectively 36 independent beams or pixels, which all together cover a field of view of 30 square degrees. Now, the reason it's called the Pathfinder project is it's still very much uh, in, in, in project uh, in, in under development. Um, they're finding it's quite, uh, quite difficult to get it to all work because if you think about it, those of you with optical experience, you'll know that uh, anything off center from a para parabola, uh, you, you get all sorts of distortion effects and coroma, uh, coma and aberration effects. Not the least, not just the same with this. So it's quite difficult to uh, actually process and get sensible results and taking all the distortions of being off axis into account. Uh, and then as a further complication, uh, this is the only telescope, these are the only radio telescope systems in the world that have a three axis controls. They can be moved in azimuth and elevation to point at the sky and they also have a polarization rotation device so the whole feed assembly itself can be rotated uh, about its center to uh, keep the uh, keep the uh, alignment correct as the as the as the sources track across the sky um, is effectively to sort of derotate de the the image that's formed on those detectors as the um, telescope scanned across scans across the sky so that's very very much late new new uh, new work un under development and that's only just being pioneered as part of the square kilometre array system in Australia. So that is a kind of a, a multi-pixel, a 36 pixel radio telescope, if you like. <clears throat> the early radio maps of the sky were pretty crude. This is the sort of effect that you tended to get in the 60s and 70s, just pretty broad brush measurements of various spots in the sky with uh, um, some of the more obvious things shown. You can see Cygnus and Centaurus and Hercules as being uh, supernova remnants, and then 3C273 and a few others uh, as, uh, as quasars. But of course, things have moved on, and I'll just include now a picture taken fairly, uh, published fairly recently from a modern Japanese telescope, a 45 meter single dish, and that's producing results of the measurements across the center of the Milky Way and you can see the incredible detail that's now possible to build up by uh, really systematically scanning just with one single radio telescope. And it's quite an incredibly detailed picture that's built up. So things have moved on a lot that was I think published uh, pictures published uh, about a year or two ago. <coughs> so that's bringing more or less up to date. But of course, that's not the end of it. There's always, a, always a, uh, an, a need to measure things in greater and greater detail. And even with a 45 meter telescope, there's a limit to the resolution you can get. Just as the way is there with um, optical telescopes, there's a limit on resolution according to the aperture. 
So how do you overcome that? Well, going back to uh, Martin Ryle's idea, if you have a number of radio telescopes or even optical telescopes spaced out, then you can actually use the signals, combine the signals from the two and get a resolution that's equivalent to, the, uh, to a, a dish or a, a lens or mirror that's the, basically the same size as the maximum distance across the array. So this is the idea of, of interferometry and what we're really aiming for in radio terms is what's called a very long baseline interferometry. In other words, using data from worldwide sources or even wider to produce ultra high resolution radio signals and radio measurements. How does this work? Well, the way it's done with radio sources is to record the data from, the, from a number of different radio telescopes while they're observing the same object. It obviously has to be done very carefully so that all the dishes involved have to be, plot, have to be tracking exactly the same radio source in the sky simultaneously. They all record the signals on computer disks with, along with precision atomic clock timing signals. That means <clears throat> that, means that uh, by making the measurements to within a few nanoseconds or even picoseconds, <clears throat> it's then possible to combine all the data sets with perfect synchronization. And using that gives the same effect as combining the signals uh, from the dishes directly. Uh, it, it has been done by, collect, by connecting relatively close uh, radio telescopes with cables, but of course it's much more convenient if you can just do, do all the measurements separately and then ship the results. In any case, the amount of data that's produced is so huge that even after a few hours it runs into terabytes and it's actually cheaper to record these on big cartridges with capacities of 30 to 50 kilo, uh, terabytes and then pop those in air freight and ship them to the computer rather than uh, actually send all that data over the internet. Uh, e even data costs money at that sort of rate. So a few notes on how this works. Here's a diagram that shows how it works. You've got your radio signals coming from somewhere over to the, the top right hand corner and the three, an the three antennas are all picking up the signal. And you can see that they are spaced out differently. Uh, there are three different baselines there, A1, A2 and A3, distances between the different antennas. Uh, each of those signals is recorded along with the signals from an atomic clock. Uh, it's it's labelled as a tape recorder there, but nowadays it's done with, uh, as I've said, with, uh, with uh, disk drive cartridges. Once you've got the signals, over several hours of observations for the same object in the sky. You can then ship all the information physically to a computer somewhere and you then play it back. But what you do this time, you keep the, the playback synchronized and you introduce a, a time delay, a signal delay, which is according to the distance between the different antennas. And if you can adjust the signal delay so that it's exactly corresponds, then you can actually get this interference. They call it, the, the people aficionados in this call it fringes rather than images, but uh, you and I would recognize that as producing a coherent image. If the signals are actually behaving themselves and synchronizing nicely, then you can actually use that data to build up a picture with much greater detail. And just exactly how much more detailed we can see from the next slide. On the right, you see a picture taken by the Merlin Array, which was the, one of the early collaborations based at Jodrell Bank, but using several radio telescopes around the United Kingdom. Uh, they were producing images of a particular uh, point, point source in the sky. Uh, just out of interest, it's called IRC plus 10420. And it's maser emission at about six gigahertz from that particular source. Now that particular source on the left, you can see this sort of picture that was built up. The picture on the right shows the, exactly the same information, but of course with completely different resolution. Now, if I just pick up the, where are we? Um, just annotate, put a spotlight on that. 
I think I can move across. So you can see that that picture, that blob there, corresponds to that little area there. That bright blob there corresponds to that blob there. And similarly, that blob there corresponds to that. Quite, a, quite an astonishing difference in resolution, as I'm sure you'll see. So the picture on the right is taken by the very long baseline interferometry project, and that was using several uh, uh, radio telescopes spaced right across the world, thousands of miles apart. So that's the that's state of the art, basically, at the moment. That's what everyone's aiming for. That's the holy grail of these things. So let me just make sure I can still move forward. Okay, let's take a break now and look at the history of satellite communications. At this stage, all that's the same is the dishes. First of all, 1945, Arthur C. Clarke came across the, the concept of the synchronous satellite. Uh, he published this in a famous paper in Wireless World when he explained that if you could position a satellite about 22,300 miles above the Earth, it would effectively stay in the same position in the sky. So if you had three of these satellites stationed over the Pacific, one over the Pacific, one over the Atlantic and one over the Indian Ocean, uh, every point on the Earth's surface would be able to see one or other of the satellites and you would then be able to communicate by it, by those satellites. Um, other, other people had suggested apparently as well, but uh, Arthur C. Clarke seems to get the first, first dibs on actual first sort of coherent publication of the idea. The early experiments were conducted in 1958 on this, first of all by completely passive reflections off, off, um, off of objects in the sky, a bit like radar. But it wasn't long before the states they tried something a bit more ambitious and in 1960 they put up an experimental uh, balloon called Echo. This was a large mylar coated balloon about 50 feet across and that floated in orbit for a few weeks and they used that as a totally passive reflector just to do some experiments. Not terribly successful and it was in a fairly low orbit and it decayed and burnt up fairly soon. There were other, some other really nasty ideas about launching thousands of thousands of copper wires into orbit to act as a permanent uh, permanent uh, reflecting surface but fortunately that that failed and, and they didn't deploy properly otherwise that would have made a complete mess of space so it wasn't until 1962 that the first really commercial uh, satellite telecommunications satellite was was launched and that of course was the famous telstar and i'm sure a lot of you in the audience are old enough to remember the cheesy pop song at the time telstar by the tornadoes, also covered by the shadows. Um, I was I was thinking of including a little clip of that, but it's a bit cheesy, so we'll we'll uh, we'll get a, get away from that. Uh, I'm sure you can all remember that. So Telstar, uh, and then Early Bird was the first synchronous satellite. Telstar was a low, fairly low orbit one, so it was a, across the sky rather quickly. And it wasn't until Intelsat came along in 1968 with the Intelsat series of satellites that enabled the uh, broadcasting of the, uh, of the Mexico City Olympic Games uh, in 1968, that really uh, telecommunications satellites and radio and TV signals came of age. So I got involved in this much very luckily uh, fairly early on. Uh, let's just look at Telstar and Goonhilly Downs. Now, the original dish at Goonhilly Downs, now named Arthur, you can see now on the right hand, on the left hand side picture, you've got the same sort of arrangement as with Jodrell Bank, a very deep dish and a relatively short quadrupod in the middle. Now, it was actually designed by the same person, that's uh, Charles' husband, and a lot of it was the same principles involved. And of course, they made just the same mistakes. The parameters were all wrong and it wasn't long, although, although it worked, it wasn't long before they realised that the what you really needed was a rather shallower, a rather longer focal length so that you could illuminate the dish more evenly. They found to their horror that the actual feed was only, only eliminating uh, about two thirds of the dish. Uh, most of the signal was just missing the dish, not going to the edges, and it was being obscured by the legs of the quadrupod. So that's why the later refurbishment of, of Arthur 
ended up with the same idea as, as Jodrell Bank. A new shallower dish was built in the, inside the original one and a much longer, uh, tri this time a tripod with the, uh, with the feed at the, at the focal point. So that's just the same, and it's exactly the same idea. As you can see, the same sort of ring round the dish, round the edge of the dish, where if you really wanted to, you could open a hatch and crawl in between the two dishes, just the same as with Jodrell Bank. <clears throat> so there we go. Um, the, the, the earliest uh, signals, of course, were, were transmitted in 1962, and I'm sure some of you perhaps remember uh, the, the heady days of this this transmission. Uh, there was Raymond Baxter valiantly trying to point to a very fuzzy picture rolling up and down saying yes there's definitely a signal there, yes I can see something, there's definitely a face there and all we got in, in, in the UK was a very disembodied picture that rolled up and down and was just about recognisable as a human face. You couldn't see anything. Very embarrassingly across in, in France at Plumeau Baudou the French were getting a perfect picture. Basically, somebody had made a cock up in the uh, design of the feed system at Goonhilly. Um, and what they'd done, they had set it up to receive the wrong hand of polarization. It was a circularly polarized signal, and they got left hand instead of right hand polarization. So they had to send up someone. Uh, I later met the guy, good became a good friend of mine, Pete Varian. He and another guy had to go up in the pouring rain the next, during the night time, and dismantle the a part of the feed and turn it round. And that changed the polarization. And the next night, the signals were perfect. It was a bit of a, it was a bit of a black mark for the engineers at Goonhilly Downs, who were severely embarrassed by the fact that their signal was about 40 decibels down on what it should have been. That's 10,000 times less than it should have been. That's why the picture was rolling, of course. But enough of that. My early career in SATCOMs was not originally with Goonhilly number one, the Telstar dish, but Goonhilly number two. So I was in, on the team that built this in 1968. <clears throat> a few statistics about it. The aperture was 90 feet, 27 and a half meters across. Total weight, 1,200 tons. And for the purposes of, of uh, satellite communications, it transmitted a 10 kilowatt signal at six gigahertz up to the satellite, and it received at four gigahertz. And in those days, it carried telephone and TV signals only. There was no data in 1968. <clears throat> because, the, because this was built for tracking synchronous satellites only, it had a very limited tracking speed of only five degrees a minute. So it took quite some time to move from one point of the sky to the other. But of course that's no problem with a synchronous satellite because all it does is just wobble around in the sky a little bit during the day. Uh, so you only need to make very small corrections during the daytime. Just in case anyone wants to see a picture, that was a picture of the Happy Crew and you can see from the picture there the scale of the steelwork for the, the structure there. And if we just pick up the pick up the point you see this great big box here that's one of the two counterweights that's one of them the other counterweights around the other side and in there's about 200 tons of scrap iron and concrete and lead uh, in order to counterbalance the, the weight of the dish and that's the happy crew that put it together and um, you can see we're sitting on this gadget which is the one of the bogies and that's one of the electric motors there that drives the uh, drives the bogey and that little arrow there is pointing to me and in those days I had a lot of dark hair and uh, uh, was, was a lot slimmer than I am today so that was my early introduction and we did in fact get Goonhilly number number two ready for reception of the um, the Mexico Olympics from 19 in 1968 late in 1968 uh, those were transmitted from a place to Lansingo of which more are on. <clears throat> so, uh, after we'd finished Goonhilly number two, uh, we moved on to Bahrain. Now, we had had enough of Dr. Husband and his failed designs by then, because Dr. Husband had also designed the structure for Goonhilly number two. And it didn't work re really. Well, it, it worked, but it was a very difficult thing to make it work properly. Meanwhile, Marconi's own engineers had been designing a much more elegant kind of dish much lighter and uh, much more easily 
steerable and a lot, lot cheaper to build. So that was what we put up in Bahrain in 1969. And you can see it's a completely different kettle of fish. Very elegant design, conical concrete tower with two slim counterweights on either side and a dish perched on the top. Uh, the total moving, moving mass was only about 300 tonnes, which made it much cheaper and simpler to, to work. And of course, it meant that the whole thing was a much lighter <coughs> and actually stronger construction. And that, that was the last time that Marconi's ever, or Marconi's ever employed husbands because Charles' husband was by this time, his company was relegated to act as, act as consultants on this. They weren't actually involved in the design, but they had a kind of a watching brief. And that was the last time we used husbands for that uh, purpose. Uh, incidentally, some years ago, I gave a talk to the University of the Third Age in Sheffield, and it, I made a few disparaging, disparaging comments about uh, husband's design for Goonhilly Number 2, and it turned out there were several people in the audience who were ex-retired members of husband's team, and I, they gave me a bit of a grilling after that. Anyway, we move on. 1969 uh, saw the Bahrain dishes, uh, Bahrain dish completed. There was also another one in Hong Kong, very similar looking one, Hong Kong one, built at the same time. <clears throat> and in those days, we used to have teleprinter chats between the two sites, swapping notes on what, what our problems were and helping each other to solve our problems. So that was two, two designs that were running side by side. We had a brief interlude down in Hampshire in early 1970, late 69, early 70, to build a military dish, small dish, which we're not supposed to talk about too much because it was part of the uh, Skynet system for the British Army, for the British forces. That's a contemporary picture of, uh, of Oak Hanger on the right hand side. Uh, then we moved across to Longanot in Kenya, and this was where the final incarnation of our own Marconi design was, was, was conceived. And you can see it's very much the same as the Bahrain one, but instead of having, <coughs> instead of having to have access through the middle of the middle of the tower to the to the uh, workings at the top this time there's a cabin on the an air conditioned cabin cabin along the top and a lift shaft that lines up with a passageway uh, all around the edge so in order to get up to the top of goon hilly of the uh, longer knot dish to do work all the equipment is inside an air conditioned cabin rather than just being on the back of the structure and it, you just get up there by going up onto the balcony, hop onto the lift, up to the, up to the uh, cabin and into the air conditioned room. Made it really nice and easy to work on. And that design was replicated a number of times around the world after I left Marconi's. Incidentally, that picture in the background, that's a volcano called Longanot. Uh, it's, a, it's a dormant volcano and it last erupted about 400 years ago. And that little hill there and that ridge there, which is about half a mile from the earth station, that's the last effect, last solidified lava flow. So if it does erupt in the future, as it might well do, the next lava flow will probably take the earth station with it, or rather what's left of it. Because this was 1971, yeah. we built that. Uh, somebody say something? No, okay. Uh, where are we? Yeah, okay, so that was that was my visit to Longan, and that was it was actually uh, being sold as a resident engineer and spending an, an extra six months in Nairobi that led me to fall in love with East Africa, and particularly to fall in love with Josie, who is patiently watching television downstairs, keeping well out of the way. So we've been together for nearly fifty years now. <clears throat> so there we go. So that's why I left Mark when I left Marconi's because I wanted to stay on in Kenya. Uh, hence working for the meteorological department, then teaching at the Polytechnic, and then did a, a UMIST course, and then set up a company that didn't last too long called Hind Electronics. Worked briefly for NG Bailey Microsystems, and then set up with another guy, Bradford Instruments Limited, which traded from 1982 to 2012, doing industrial control systems, uh, quite a lot of machine tool control systems as well. I also did some other independent work as for Hein Engineering Limited at the same time, and then from 2000, 2000 onwards, taught part-time at University of Bradford. So that's what led me to this stage in my career. <clears throat>
which of course leads me to how on earth I came to get to the post of Dara Consultant. So Dara stands for Development in Africa with Radio Astronomy. This is a project which is masterminded by several people at Leeds University and Manchester University and Oxford University. And it's funded by uh, the uh, fund called the Newton Fund from the British government uh, and gets in support from other people as well, as you can see. And the idea of this is to use the topic of radio astronomy to kickstart the development of uh, university departments uh, and further education and higher education uh, across Africa particularly but also in other parts of the developing world. The idea is that the uh, by setting up this uh, support network uh, developing countries which are interested and they have a, a university that's interested could get uh, involvement in radio astronomy. They send their students to Leeds or Manchester or Oxford to un undertake studies, MPhils and PhDs and get trained in radio astronomy and then when they go back they can of course help in the development of radio astronomy and of course in many cases some of these many cases these African uh, places and developing countries they have earth stations which are no longer required because the large dishes that I've talked about now really became obsolete in about the mid 1990s to 2000s because by that time technology had moved on satellites were more sophisticated frequencies were higher and you could get the same performance from a much smaller and cheaper dish so in many cases the dishes were demolished or dismantled but in plenty of other cases the dishes were just left there uh, or put into mothballs and so they're ripe for conversion into radio telescopes all you've got to do is refurbish them or bring them up to scratch and take away the transmitters and fit them with a radio astronomy receiver and there you are you've got a radio telescope for about a, a tenth or even a hundredth the price of building a brand new one from scratch typically it might cost you a million or two dollars to refurbish whereas it might cost you a hundred million dollars to build something from new so that's the plan um, i was taken on by uh, melvin hoare of leeds university uh, he saw, he came to Bradford to give a talk in 2018 and just chatting over over a meal with him that evening he realized that that was my background in the engineering of the control systems and so he got me on board and I have so far participated in uh, events in Ghana and Uruguay and Mexico and I'm also working on a project for Kenya but of course unfortunately the Kenya project has had to be put on ice with the lack of travel. So let's just briefly summarise what I've done, show you some pretty pictures of the lucky, the great life I've had. Uh, my wife jokingly said that they'd pay me to do this job. Well, that was almost true because there was a bit of a hiatus in the payment, but I have been, I have been paid for the work done now. So let's just look, see what happened in Ghana. In Ghana, we attended a conference where they have actually successfully converted uh, one of these uh, disused derelict or uh, disused uh, redundant satellite stations into a very serviceable radio telescope <clears throat> this is a rather different design of radio telescope you can see from the ones i've shown before and this is quite interesting because this uses this became the the standard all of the dishes we looked at up to now with marconi's they were basically of a cassegrain system where you have a sub reflector and the feed set a feed at the middle now <clears throat> The, it turns out that that's, that's quite a, it, it's a very efficient way to do things, but it's quite expensive. And the problem is that all of the radio receiving equipment has to be attached to the back of the dish. Now, somebody came up with this concept called, called the beam waveguide. Now, the way it works is quite subtle. <clears throat> Here's a diagram of it. So you can see that you have your main reflector here, the signals, come, the signals come from space, they bounce off the main dish onto the subreflector, and then the subreflector bounces the, the beam back into this uh, space at the mirror, to a mirror at the, on, on the axis. Can you see that? There's a, along there is the line of the elevation axis of the antenna, and there is a mirror which is positioned on that axis. 
So as the beam comes down, it's focused onto there and it reflects along the axis then to another mirror and then down, oops, down, oops, hang on, and then, and then, and then down into the main beam wave guide here. Then it bounces off another mirror and another one and now it's going vertically downwards and that then reflect, uh, reflects the beam exactly down the azimuth axis. So the beam along there is along the elevation axis, along here is the azimuth axis, so that basically as the antenna rotates and elevates, the beam here is in exactly the same position, except that it rotates. But you can easily take account of that with some clever jiggery pokery. So basically the beauty of this is that your radio transmitters and receivers are fixed down here and they're all inside a nice air conditioned pedestal room with no need to clamber out on the structure. Makes the whole thing very light uh, and easy to construct. Because there's the extra reflections here you do lose some signal so generally you have to have a rather larger dish. So typically whereas Marconi settled on a 30 meter dish most of the beam waveguide dishes were 34 meters to make up for the slight loss of signal through all these bounces. But it turned out to be a very good effective system and unfortunately Marconi's were no longer competitive because Marconi's we were producing a Rolls-Royce product whereas everyone in, in the world, the Japanese and the Americans, were building a Ford product just like this one. And I'll just show you some pictures of what that looks like on the ground. So that's looking up at the behind the behind the structure of the beam waveguide. You can see the that's the back of the main reflector and the sub reflector focuses it down onto that mirror then it bounces to there along the axis down here down to there and then down on the vertical axis. So very simple and straightforward and it means that the rotating mass of the antenna is a lot less and it's a lot cheaper to build. So there we are <clears throat> and a lot of the dishes are, uh, that are being converted are along these lines. So that's a, a, another picture of it. Um, it does move rather slowly and uh, there is a, if I click on this you can just about see it moving and you probably hear the sound. If you listen carefully there's a sort of a squeaking noise in the background. There we are, a slight rhythmic squeak as something's moving along. And you can see just how slowly these things move. I'll just click on a bit further to show it has actually moved. You can actually see it moving there. I'll go back a moment. Just... Oops. Sorry. It's about there. So if you look just carefully, you can see the wheel and track moving. On the top of the pedestal room there is a circular track with four wheels and then there's a large sector there you can see that black line is a line of gear teeth and again that's being driven by motors around the other side and you can see that moving slowly with the squeaking noise but it's about as exciting as watching paint dry so we'll skip on right to the end to look inside the dish now and you can see now the the sub reflector and the aperture through which the signals go down to that first mirror. So there we are, that's the dish in Ghana. Uh, later in February, Feb uh, in March rather, I visited a site called Manga at Montevideo in Uruguay, where they have a rather interesting uh, disused satellite dish that uh, seems to be ripe for conversion into a radio telescope. This is a bit of a prima donna of a device. It's built by the Italians and it has a number of rather interesting features and it's also had a bit of a checkered history because it was completely abandoned for about eight years ago and although it's remained safe on the site because the same site is the is their main internet uh, switching hub so although it's remained safe from vandalism uh, the birds had been getting at it which is why they put that netting around it to try to stop the birds getting in but that didn't work too well and then unfortunately what happened was that the being parked at Zenith for all those years, over a period of a number of years, the sub-reflector, which was made of fiberglass, actually filled up with water inside. Um, it had about three or four hundred kilos of water in it. 
and eventually the weight of the water and the corrosion of the bolts caused this this sub reflector full of water to drop from the center of the feed there down into the dish and it actually went clean through the dish and damaged several panels and several other panels are also damaged by wind and other damage so you can see there's a there's a gap there and a gap there and it's going to take a bit of refurbishment but it's an interesting dish and it has a number of interesting features there you can see the holes in the dish which were made by the sub reflector falling it's not supposed to be a gap there now this is an unusual design in that it has no counterweight despite the fact that the dish weighs a couple of hundred tons there's no counterweight it's all jacked up and down by this device which is a very long lead screw like a like a jacking screw which is over 25 feet long and it's behind this uh, this telescopic housing so there's no counter counterbalance weight at all on the actual motion and furthermore the whole structure has to be prevented from tipping over by a 62 ton concrete block which is mounted across the back of the structure that moves around on the on the rails you can see that there that's that weighs 62 tons and that's again visible there so it has some interesting and rather strange properties that's the damaged sub reflector which uh, was recovered and lowered to the ground and will need some well will probably need to be completely re replaced because it's it's broken in several places so big job on but should be interesting that shows you the scale of the the electric motors that are required for the elevation drive absolutely huge 240 horsepower electric motors are required to drive it through a huge gearbox and that's the lead screw which jacks it up and down and that's a picture of the elevation axis with an encoder that measures the position that's looking out across the flat plains towards Montevideo and as you do wandering around Montevideo one Saturday afternoon in between jobs I came across this car would you believe it a 1955 Hillman Californian convertible anyone in the audience remember that I possibly not but uh, I'd never expected to see one of those ever again in my whole life yeah that was quite quite a fine interesting place Montevideo then <clears throat> later in August I went to Tulancingo Mexico now this was the place from where the 1968 Mexico Olympics were televised Tulancingo is about 70 miles northeast of Mexico City and it was the space chosen for their satellite link station um, it's in a valley so it's shielded from uh, the interference from Mexico City itself uh, it's, it's in a valley and it's a rather interesting little place and nowadays it has it has two dishes that one there was built for the original uh, Mexico games in 1968 just the same time as we as I was involved on in building the Goonhilly number two dish and then that dish was another one built in the late late 70s early 80s to increase the capacity typically in these two station arrangements one would operate to the to the uh, Atlantic and one would operate across to the Pacific in the case of Mexico or in UK one would operate to the Indian Ocean and one to the uh, one to the Atlantic so what were we doing in Tulancingo well we were sizing up the possibilities of converting the uh, original Mexico dish uh, for use as a radio telescope and that shows me standing on the balcony of one of, of the older of the other dish the younger dish looking towards the Mexico 1968 dish that was built by the Mitsubishi company and you can see it's a completely different design yet again it has the concrete tower and the walkway around the edge but this time the uh, receiver receiver and transmitter equipment is housed in a cabin on the side and there's an arrangement called the Kude focus where the signal is bounced off the sub reflector onto a mirror on the axis and then horizontally out into this cabin which moves around so again that gives you sort of the best of both worlds because you've got uh, uh, you, you've got a nice air-conditioned cabin and the radio equipment can be can be stationary so what do we see when we get closer to it well this gives you an idea of the scale of the engineering again this weighs several hundred tons and you can see that's the back of the coup focus the 
main main the sub the, the beam comes in from the sub reflector bounces off that mirror and along the axis into the cabin now inside the uh, the uh, elevation motor cabin you come across this arrangement of two two electric motors so the two electric motors here and this is a huge gearbox you see these uh, well in fact two separate huge gearboxes one there and one there and there's a little hole there and basically when all else fails you can flick a switch to take the brakes off and then you put a handle just like a starting handle into that hole and you can crank the whole thing round several hundred tons you can crank, crank it round and round and up and down very very slowly by hand it takes several thousand turns of the handle to make it work from one end to the, uh, the other but it can be done and it's quite fun to do so there we have it that's the uh, that's where you put the starting handle in to drive it manually and as I say those are the electric motors to to drive it <coughs> where are we um, another feature of these dishes of course is that when they're going to be refurbished in order to make it worthwhile you've got to check that the dish is still in good condition now these days it's done by photogrammetry and um, I was also working with a guy called Dave Gale who is the chief me chief metrologist for the large millimeter telescope uh, near Puebla in Mexico and he and his uh, team have placed reflective targets all over the surface of the dish so that at night what they can do is they can take a photograph of that dish illuminated by floodlights they take a photograph with an ultra high resolution digital camera they take pictures of the dish from several different positions and then a, a computer can take all the data from those points and mash it all together and produce a profile map to the nearest fraction of a millimeter to show the shape of the dish and that's another important thing of course with refurbishing these dishes to make sure they're in good condition so there you see the see the the dish with the reflective targets and the uh, uh, structure on the back so that's two lansingo really nice dish <clears throat> i was supposed to have gone to kenya to look at the possibilities of doing the refurbishment there but of course the coronavirus thing has brought everything to a halt the last few months that's the station that we built i've shown you a picture of that all originally built in 1971 but built in the early 80s was another dish of beam waveguide design similar to the one in Ghana uh, and that would be the one that we would we would focus on converting if anything's possible at all but it turns out that the site the site was abandoned completely without any security and of course from far from being out far from being out in the wilds uh, it's now totally surrounded by settlements and farms and chambers and the whole place has been ransacked so pictures shown to be inside show a rather disturbing story that's the inside of the control room which I last visited in 1976 when it was a beautiful beautifully appointed control room with suspended floor and desks and consoles and everything nowadays the place is just a wreck and unfortunately for the project somebody's stolen the big gearboxes for the azimuth and elevation so you can see we've we're missing two large gearboxes from the azimuth drives and two large gearboxes from the elevation replay we'd have to replace the motors anyway but replacing the gearbox is a real pain and could be a bit of a deal breaker because it might cost fifty thousand pounds a time to get gear replacement gearboxes designed and built so it's a bit of a shame that but we won't know for sure until i can travel again we can go out and do a proper survey and give some advice so aren't I a lucky guy to have the ability at this late stage of my life to be re-employed re doing such an exciting project so here's a summary of the project we're trying to establish research centers in universities in developing countries uh, the guys at Leeds and Manchester and New Oxford are training and funding researchers to do MPhil and PhD programs and wherever possible we'll con convert existing dishes and possibly even build new smaller ones all over Africa and elsewhere and eventually there should be dozens of these dishes all linked together to carry out 
even more very long baseline interferometry collaborations. So that's the long term project. Just to summarize what's happened on VLBI so far, it was VLBI that gave us the image of a black hole recently. There were eight observatories scattered around the world that were involved in it. So there's one, two, three, four across there, one in Mexico, as you can see, one down in Chile, uh, and another one there, and another one, I think there's one over in, have we got in? Uh, there's one missing, I think that's somewhere over in Japan. Anyway, that was the uh, you bet the collaboration, it was called the EHT Event Horizon, Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. And they were able, using the VLBI techniques, to produce a detailed image of a black hole itself. And if you remember, that was the thing that was published in April 2019. And it very nicely confirmed lots of things to do with black holes and Einstein and all the rest of it. So that's a quick sum summary of my favourite dishes. Um, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's been a real privilege this last 18 months to be working on this, although I haven't really managed to do much con concrete work in the last three or four months. Uh, but hopefully we'll be back on the road, travelling to Kenya, uh, perhaps Madagascar, uh, possibly even Mauritius and several other places before the money runs out for my funding at the end of next year. So thank you very much for listening. I'll just conclude with a couple of uh, couple of acknowledgements. Most of the most of the photographs of Earth stations are my own, or they're from Wikipedia websites, and other information is from NASA, ESA, and CSIRO websites. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed my uh, my rather self indulgent little story. So thank you again for listening, and that's all for me. Thank you. So the way we need to do the questions, Rod, if you don't mind, yep, is okay. that I will invite people to indicate if they've got a question, a hand up, and yep. I'll nominate them. So yep. we don't have lots of people cross talk. So, uh, a quick question from me to start off with while everybody's thinking about theirs. Um, what's happening with Goon Hilly Downs at the moment? Ah, well, there's a good point. Yeah. Um, the whole Goon Hilly site was sold for one pound to a chap called Ian Jones some years ago on, on, on condition that he would actually undertake a, a, a complete revamp of the whole job. And uh, so far he's managed to raise quite a lot of money and in fact quite a lot of them, quite, quite a large chunk of money from this project uh, uh, with a sort of different, with a different label on it has gone to Goon Hilly. Now, uh, what I didn't mention, because there's a limited amount of time, is that my colleagues that I left, uh, when I left Marconi in 1971, my colleagues carried on building a number of other earth stations. They went on to build three stations in the Caribbean, Trinidad, Barbados and Jamaica, uh, and also one on uh, Baham either Bahamas or Bermuda, um, one down in, in Cornwall at Bude, another one at Maidley in, ha in Herefordshire, and also uh, a second dish in Hong Kong. And what uh, I uh, didn't cover, of course, is they also built one of those same dishes in Goon Hilly. And actually, that, the dish at Goon Hilly has already, or is in the process of being converted into a radio telescope. So the old Marconi, the Mar effectively the, the third dish that Marconi's built, uh, the, sorry, the yeah, the, I think it was Goonhilly three. They call it Goonhilly number three. The Goonhilly number three dish uh, that is actually to the Marconi design, same as East Africa and all the all the later ones, and that was actually successfully converted, or is in the process of being converted into a radio telescope at the moment. Um, a team from Oxford were designing and building the cryogenically cooled receiver system for it, and they got some control system experts down in Cornwall to uh, strip out the old motors and replace them and refurbish them. So now I was supposed to be going down to Goon Hilly to, uh, uh, to, to sort of get some uh, idea of best practice and the story so far, but even that was cancelled due to the coronavirus. But it, it is very active and there's a lot of activity. In addition, Ian Jones, in addition to the radio astronomy, uh, Ian Jones is also running several other projects there to do with uh, data communications. He's acting a kind of a data switching hub 
for computer data all around the world. And also interestingly, uh, for, for, for the amateurs in radio amateurs in the in the business, uh, they are also hosting some activity to do with Q OS Q O Q O one hundred, the Qatari OS uh, Qatar Oscar one hundred uh, amateur radio synchronous satellite, and they actually have a, a, a couple of receiving stations which are available online. So if you're experimenting with the uh, amateur radio satellite amateur satellite communications. You can use the down link at Goonhilly Downs. You can just log into it uh, as an SDR on an online website SDR and you can uh, monitor the performance. So there is a lot of activity going on down there and uh, I'm, I, I can't wait to go down there and see what, see what it's all about. It'll That's take me back news. to my early years. Thank you. Right, That's excellent news. Uh, so has anybody got a question? Uh, Peter Lloyd, can you unmute your, yourself, Peter? I nearly always forget that, don't I? <laughs> a couple of sort of technical things that, that, that I was puzzled by. Uh, yeah. In your plot, at about a third of the way through your talk, you had the plot of signal strength in Jansky's against um, the frequency. Yeah. I noticed that the plot for the moon was a dead straight line across the whole plot. And I just wondered where does that radio, what's the source of that radiation from the moon? Um, I, I, I'll pass on that and say I'm not really sure. Uh, to be honest, the, the, as, as I indicated, and as you can see from the, the classification of the different slopes and different shapes of, of the um, shapes of the graphs, each, each slope or shape of graph represents a diff different physical mechanism. Uh, so I, 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 I'm not really sure at all. Uh, the, which is a dead straight line, no? Yeah, yeah. So, so some of them, some of them, by by virtue of the physics, come out as dead straight lines. Other, others are more or less straight lines with slight modifications. Others are really strange. When, for instance, if you look at if the 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 higher sit the, the stronger signals from Jupiter, in the sort of twenty megahertz region, they actually come from a kind of a synchrotron radiation induced by by uh, ions flowing around the orbit of Io because as you probably know, Io is very highly volcanic and it spews a lot of sulfur and ionized sulfur into space around it. And of course, that, the, ionized, the ionized gases escaping from uh, Io are then acted on by the magnetic fields of Jupiter and that's what produces the radiation. So that, that's why that has a particular characteristic of radiation. It's some kind of synchrotron radiation from the electrons spiraling round in the in the orbit of Io and the magnetic field of Jupiter. So there's all sorts of interesting things going on. There's plenty that we can see. And in fact, there is, it's quite relatively easy to pick up that signal uh, just with a uh, uh, sort of a, a 30 foot long dipole in a back garden and a suitable receiver. That signal is really quite strong and can be picked up quite easily. That's uh, <coughs> one of my projects for later is to, to, to build the, build the uh, a receiving antenna for the the Jupiter signals. Oh, well, well, thank you. I'm sorry if I can. I, can yeah. I ask yeah. you another one? which is much more technical engineering, maybe. I, I also noticed on the uh, the telescope with the waveguide coming down. Yeah. The waveguide appears to have a focusing action. Is that a property of waveguides, or were some no? Of no, that's curved? a property of the mirrors. The mirrors are curved. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. the, the mirrors are are they? They have a very accurate curve on them, uh, and they are. The, the uh, ev even such things as the thickness of the paint and the ki the kind of paint on them has to be controlled very carefully, because as you can imagine, with all with with having to bounce off multiple surfaces, uh, each time you bounce off, you lose a little bit of signal. Right. So the whole the whole thing is quite quite tricky, and a, an, an unexpected problem of dishes that have been abandoned is that you get a, a, a build up of green algae on the mirror dishes. And the, the green algae, of course, retains moisture, and that is that is very good at absorbing the signals. So yeah. one of the things that has to be done is that all the algae uh, has to be scraped off and polished off and cleaned off remarkably thoroughly, and possibly even stripped stripped down to the metal and, and repainted. Otherwise, the signal level will will be, a, you know, even a decibel or two, two lower after all those bounces. So it's a bit of a problem. Thank you. Okay, anybody else got a question? Uh, Peter. 
Um, mine's just a question of amazement. Uh, when you visited the facility, uh, 1976, I think, in uh, one of the African countries, and then more recently, which was ransacked, when you mentioned that some of the motors had been stolen off the uh, dish, particularly the gear motor, uh, perhaps an obvious question, or maybe not so obvious question, what, what could anybody possibly uh, need such a gear motor for, unless it's got such use outside astronomy? I mean, my mind's boggling. Yeah. Well, it's quite, it's quite easy. You obviously never lived in Africa. No, I in haven't, Af no. In Africa, even the scrap metal in a, in a rusty old wire brush is worth something. Right. So okay. it, was just, it was just stolen in, stolen for scrap metal, that's all. Okay. Uh, and as, a, as each gearbox weighs about a tonne, yeah. that's an awful lot of scrap metal, and that's, that's a lot of money for somebody. Yeah, and it's just wasted uh, an just engine which... That's right, yeah. and it would have had also probably had a few kilos of brass in it from bearings and yeah. various other things. So, uh, I mean, as I say, we, we we would expect the motors to be removable and scrapped because mm -hmm. we'd have to refurbish and replace the motors anyway. Yeah, because the motors are all completely out of date. Uh, but but discovering that the gearboxes had gone. In fact, what I've been doing, uh, I spent quite a lot of time last the back end of last year. Um, I I managed to get a list of all the Earth stations in the whole world, which is several hundred of them. And then using the wonderful facilities of Google Maps and Google Earth and Google Street View, I actually virtually visited dozens and dozens of these Earth stations to look from the outside of the security fences, to look at them and try and identify what kind of what maker make who had made the structure. And whether it was the same kind of design, and I then ended up emailing the 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 um, authorities that owned or ran those places in the past, or sometimes somehow still do own them, and say, uh, "Could you send me photos of the gearboxes if they're still there?" In the hope that we would find an identical dish that was no longer wanted but actually had gearboxes present. Um, so that was quite an interesting little exercise. Unfortunately, it turned up. It turned up many, uh, uh, many dishes of exactly the same design as the other one in Mexico. Unfortunately, a completely different design of wheel and gearbox. Mm -hmm. So I've not. That's 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 an ongoing thing. Is to is to get back to the hunt, and um, and see if I can track down a, a station that's that's redundant. They don't need the motors and we can, motors and gearboxes, and we can at least actually perhaps negotiate with them to salvage the gearboxes and ship them across to Kenya but obviously if we can't find the actually identical fit then we're going to have to get some new ones designed from scratch which will be very expensive because you're looking at gearboxes which handle torques of the orders of several hundred tons feet I'm not quite sure what that's in newton meters but uh, you know th think think hundreds of tons feet a gearbox to handle that sort of force, that sort of torque, is, is quite a heavy and, and uh, difficult thing to do. You don't just buy those off the shelf, that's for sure. Okay, Pete. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else got a question? Uh, Phil, turn on your microphone. Sit. Thank you, I can turn it on now. Right, look, I, I thought Skynet was invented by Hollywood for Terminator. <laughs> Obviously it wasn't. <laughs> Did you get a patent on the name and are you are getting royalties from Hollywood? <laughs> well, there's an interesting thought. Um, yes, the uh, Skynet system was uh, consisted of three, uh, three dishes, one on Cyprus, uh, one at Christchurch in Hampshire, and then another one at, um, at Oakhanger in Hampshire. I, that was the one I was working on, and also another one in Singapore. So that's four altogether. Um, and it was conceived in the sort of the back end of the 1960s uh, and introduced in the early 1970s <laughs> yeah. as a secure um, secure system for the forces to use. Um, as I say, I sort of jokingly say we're not supposed to talk about it. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah. The, the the really clever bit there, even we weren't allowed to get anywhere near. There were several Marconi's were responsible for building the actual structure and the transmitters and receivers. Uh, 
and most of the infrastructure around it. Uh, but there were there were a couple of special co special racks of equipment that were painted in a sort of hammer effect blue, and they were supplied by GEC, and they had steel panels locked across the front of them. And whenever the guys from GEC came down to work on those, they would station RAF policemen with 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 uh, M16s drawn, standing really? at the doors of the control room. While these two or three experts actually did their business, did their did their magic on these uh, on these special racks. Um, the story the story was that underneath these lockable steel covers, there was a whole series of setting dials, which controlled the code that was being used. And, um, okay. The story was that uh, if if you this was back in the late sixties, early seventies, is that without that without knowing the code. You'd have to you'd have to crunch the data for 110 years to be able to crack the code, <laughs> but if you could read off those dials, you could crack it in 10 minutes. Which is obviously why they were so so paranoid World, about it. World War II technology. Yeah, well, it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit reminiscent of the of the rotors yeah. on the on the yeah. Enigma dial, but but brought up yeah. to date, of course. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, anyway, that's Fantastic. A story. That, that Fantastic. was as much as they would tell us. That was as much as they would tell us. No, thanks, thanks for that brilliant talk, by the way. Oh, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I, I just count myself so lucky that I've had this opportunity to, to have such fun, you know. <laughs> That's half the uh, task of having a, an enjoyable fun, uh, job, though, isn't it? Uh, finding the fun. Uh, oh, absolutely, yeah. Has anybody else got a question? Uh, Gary? Do you think that any of the uh, projects that you're working on will be affected by the uh, satellite broadband, like the Starlink uh, constellation Ooh. coming out? Um, amazingly, probably not. Um, the, the fact is, of course, that with radio telescopes, you're normally looking at very specific frequencies. There's quite a lot of the work is done by uh, looking at the spectrum of these radio sources. Um, which usually implies that you're analysing a, a range of frequencies. So the fact is that as provided the frequency you're analyse you're using isn't actually the same as the satellites are using, you're really not going to have much difficulty at all. It's, it's, I'm, sure it's be a, I'm sure it's going to be disastrous for optical and photographic astronomers. Let's say some of, the, some of the professional radio telescopes are going to have problems because it's so close to the band and they're not very oh, good at keeping on band. Oh well, yeah, maybe, maybe so then. As I say, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not privy to the details of that, and um, uh, so the, the the significance of that hasn't actually filtered through the <laughs> through to the the people I'm talking to. Okay. Okay, Gary. Uh, Tony Morris. Hi, Rod. Hi, yeah. Very good talk. Excellent. Uh, go back to your Jansky chart. Oh, yeah. uh, some of the objects uh, were, were certainly down in the like 90, 80 megahertz. So the exactly. bottom end of the moon, uh, the Orion Nebula and stuff like that. How difficult is it for amateurs to pick up stuff like that? Um, it's not that difficult. Um, if you have, say, a, a two or three meter dish, you should easily be able to pick up those signals. And, and e even a one meter dish will pick up the hydrogen line emission from the uh, from the center of the galaxy, from the center of our galaxy. A one meter dish connected to a spectrum analyzer, and, and let's face it, these days a spectrum analyzer could be a little gadget such as called a fun cube, which costs 140 quid, which you just plug into the USB port on your computer. Um, it, it's a wonderful device, that the little fun cube, um, and you can, uh, load up with a kind of a, a spectrum analyzer program and you can actually uh, with a maybe a, a, a one meter dish you should be able to pick up the signal from the center of the galaxy and you should actually be able to see the shape of the Doppler, Doppler effect the way the rotation of the different parts of the galaxy and the hydrogen line the way it varies it, it's quite that's quite easy to 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 do to say a one meter dish or perhaps an array of maybe three or perhaps an array of four Yagi aerials, four long Yagi aerials, 
it's at 1.421 megahertz which is relatively easy frequency to handle these days all right so could could the yagis be buried underground no that's not going to help <laughs> well I'm, I'm i'm thinking of uh, on our site road our, our observatory uh we we've built a small manhole away from the observatory and we're going to put a magnetometer in there and other oh, bits right. and pieces so yeah. we've been thinking of what else can we use this for because it's got like a, a 10 meter pipe from the observatory to the manhole mm. so you know could you use the the, the pipe as a, a a place for an aerial say no no it's it, you'd, you'd find that the the attenuation of anything even the atom at that frequency even the attenuation of raindrops uh, will cause signal loss so you've really got to have a, a bear a bear dish or a bear yagi pointed straight at the sky uh, if any, anything around it or shielding it will be at room temperature and will introduce that noise that i talked about no, okay, thank you've you. You've always got that problem. If you if you if you have a radio if you have a radio astronomy dish or or yagi, and you point it at the ground, or point it at a building at room temperature, the 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 reading would just go off the scale. You've you've got to you've got to be pointing them at the sky because the sky has a, well, naturally has a background rate background temperature of about three kelvin. If you oh, think about okay. it, that's the, the background temperature of the sky is the cosmic ma microwave background radiation. So uh, against against the three three Kelvin sky temperature, most objects will stand out. But uh, in any hint of radiation from the ground, that's a, that's a problem you have, of course, in the design of these dishes. Is you have to design them so that even if you're pointing the ref main reflector up into the sky, you have to be very careful that the stray reflections off the edges of the sub-reflector and the main reflector don't reflect any radiation from the earth into the main focus of the dish. That could be quite disastrous. And if you look at some, some of the early Philco Ford satellite dishes, they had a, kind of a rather curious looking a range of baffles outside the edge of the dish. And you'd think, well, what, what's the purpose of that? Well, how can that help? Because it's actually outside the dish and that was designed to stop the spillover of radiation from the earth diffracting around the edge of the main dish and into the into the receivers it's quite a tricky business if you had a hole in the in the reflector you would lose a tiny bit of signal but you'd gain a huge amount of noise because the the sub reflector would see the earth through the hole so it's, it's quite it's uh, interesting lots of interesting design things come in that you have to think about okay thank you Okay, Tony. Uh, Mike Scott. Yeah. Oh, hang on. There's Roy there. Yeah, I've already picked up Mike Scollin. Can you turn uh -huh. on your uh, turn on your microphone, Mike? Uh, hi, Ron. Um, oh, yeah. uh, early radio astronomy. Did Nikolai Tesla have anything to contribute there? I seem to remember that he detected some extraterrestrial signals. Oh well, um, I'll, I'll pass on that. I'll pass on that. It, it didn't come out in my researches. <laughs> As I, I say, when he was in Colorado Jet Springs, sorry, um, he he thought it was coming from Mars or Venus. Oh right, well I'll I'll look into that. I'm always interested to hear any contributions. Yeah, uh, late late 1890s. Okay, let me just make a note of that on a piece of paper. Always, I always always looking for. Where's my pen? Where's my pen gone? Always looking for. You say 1890. I think it was the late 1890s. Yeah. Um, and it was when he was at Colorado Springs. Right, I shall look into that. Cool. Thank you for that. Thank you, John. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, Roy Gunson. Yeah. Uh, I was just going back to the point that came out when Tony was asking his question about attenuation. Uh, so presumably, if raindrops affect uh, attenuation, radio telescopes don't work that well in cloudy weather? right good good point um the it's a matter of degree and it's also very much a matter of the, the exact wavelength and frequency you're using um certainly towards the higher end of of radio telescope use which is sort of a, above seven eight ten gigahertz that's a sort of getting on for wavelengths of three centimeters or less then rain does in fact affect it pretty badly 
and even clouds will eventually affect it. Um, clouds not too bad, but raindrops are certainly a problem. Um, if you get down to the, the lower frequencies, sort of below one gigahertz, where there are some lots of interesting phenomena go on, uh, by the, at that stage the, uh, the, the rain, rain and water vapour attenuation drops off dramatically. So uh, you get some idea of when this effect begins to kick in, of course, because 2.4 gigahertz is the frequency of microwave ovens and uh, water, liquid water at, uh, at 2.4 gigahertz it soaks up quite a lot of the quite a large proportion of the microwave energy so uh, you know 2.4 gigahertz and rain raindrops that would attenuate the signal uh, that's generally uh, well generally speaking it, it doesn't affect things too badly for satellite to, for your satellite tv which works on about 10 gigahertz but that's only because the signal levels are so high from the satellites that there is a there is a slight attenuation of one or two dbs during heavy rainstorms. But of course, one or two dBs is not going to affect your digital TV signal, whereas one or two dBs of loss could be quite crucial for making a, an astronomy ob observation if you're trying to quantify it. But it's a good point, good point, yeah. I have to explain, Rob, that uh, Roy's our resident rain god. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, yeah, I mean, that's the, the um, Raid, that's why radar is so, so good at picking up rain, of course, because the radar, uh, radar frequencies are a few centimetres. That, that bounces off, in addition to being absorbed by water, it also bounces off raindrops quite nicely. So. It occurs to me, Roy, that the, um, uh, the, the temperature of the cloud is going to be very high compared with deep space. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point, actually. Um, the... There, there is an easy, there is a quite an easy way to detect clouds. That most most of the remote, uh, unattended telescope installations, they have a cloud detector, and a cloud detector consists of a thermocouple, or thermopile between two aluminium plates. One aluminium plate faces the ground, and the other faces the sky. And when there's a big temperature difference between them, that's when the sky is clear, and when there's no temperature difference between them, that's when it's cloudy. So that's a, qu a quick and easy way of detecting clouds is indeed by the, the ambient thermal radiation. Uh, but fortunately for, for, for many purposes, the radio signals for te tele radio telescopes, they, they will go through clouds reasonably well. It's the, rain, the actual drops that are the real problem. And of course, the other problem is that raindrops can, uh, can collect on the reflectors. And also in, in some designs, the radio waves have to pass through 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 mylar windows you know <clears throat> the, the ones which the ones you i've shown you with the big gaping hole in the middle of the dish the beam waveguides there's no there's no there's no shielding at all but the other ones that actually have the feed uh, mounted on the dish itself there's usually a a, a plastic uh, mylar plastic film radome across the actual antenna horn and if that gets wet the signal level drops by several decibels so usually they have a, an arrangement with a blower that can blow blow a high velocity air across the face of the of the the mylar film in order to keep it dry or keep the raindrops off. But wouldn't the cloud produce a lot more noise? Um, I, I, the, 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 I think I think it's something to do with the. You remember I talked about these. Um, signal to noise ratios and bandwidth. Um, if you think about it, although the cloud is, is, is producing thermal noise, that's at really, really short frequencies and over a huge bandwidth, over a bandwidth of God knows how many umpteen orders of magnitude. Whereas um, we're, we're, we're talking about radio frequencies and generally looking in relatively narrow channels. So maybe, maybe that's the answer. But that's an interesting point. I think uh, I, sh I shall I shall also make a note of that. So I'm forewarned as <laughs> next time I get a question, cloud attenuation. Okay, you know gentlemen. Thank uh, you. It's getting on, and uh, we've worked Rod really really hard tonight oh, yeah. with the questions. So can we just? Uh, Thank you, in our usual Mexican Swinton Astronomical Society manner. We don't clap, Rod. 
what we do is we give you a big wave. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Okay, thank yeah. you very much, sir. Always.